Timothy Samuel Shaw is Adjunct Senior Fellow for Religion and Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, Senior Research Scholar at the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs at Boston University, and formerly Senior Fellow in Religion and World Affairs at the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. He also serves as a principal researcher for the Religion and Global Politics Research Project at Harvard University. As these distinguished titles suggest, his work focuses upon the nexus of religion and foreign policy as he studies religious movements and their impact on global democratization, including evangelical Protestants in Africa and Latin America, Hindu nationalists in India, and Islamists in South Asia and the Middle East. Dr. Shaw has an AB magna cum laude with highest honors in government and a PhD in political science, both from Harvard University. He also studied theology and law at Christ Church at Oxford University. His PhD dissertation on religion and the origins of liberal political thought in early modern Europe, If God Does Not Exist, Hugo Grotius and the Secular Foundations of Modern International Politics, was awarded the Aaron Waldowski Award for Best Dissertation in Religion and Politics by the American Political Science Association. He has published many articles and is the chief editor of the Oxford University Press series on evangelical Christianity and democracy in the global south and has appeared in many media and policy venues, including the US State Department, the Brookings Institution, the New York Times Magazine, BBC, and the Wall Street Journal. I could list his dozens of intriguing works and speeches, but that would take the entire evening. Perhaps his most interesting title is Why God is Winning, published in Foreign Policy in July 2006. Now that we know the answer to the question of whether or not the purported creator of the universe will prevail, let us welcome Dr. Timothy Samuel Shaw. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much to uh, the Center for the Study of Religion here at Princeton. Thanks very much to the Woodrow Wilson School for uh, co-hosting this lecture. I'm very grateful to Professor Westnow, to uh, Dr. Legath, uh, to, uh, to Larry. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. In my lecture today, I want to advance a certain claim about the historical trend line in the relationship between religion and international relations. Namely, that religion has returned as a major factor in the world's politics, both within states and between states. In our post-9-11 world, the ubiquity of religiously inclined individuals and organizations, whether Muslim, Christian, or Hindu, moderate or extremist, democratic or theocratic, violent or peaceable, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the Dalai Lama, or Sarah Palin, might seem to make this claim bloom obvious. Uh, isn't it obvious that there is religion and uh, religiously based politics everywhere? Well, I don't think it is obvious. And I think we need to clarify what we mean when we say that religion is returning to international politics. And it isn't obvious in part because from the point of view of the major traditions through which international relations has been studied and practiced in the West for several centuries, it's not that clear or at least it isn't clear how religion is returning to global politics. If the chief traditions in international relations thought are secular ones, there is in fact good reason for this. International relations and international relations theory, after all, took shape through a secularizing set of historical events, the transition from medieval Europe to the modern system of sovereign states that was consolidated around the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. To explain how this transition was secularizing and how its secular character became ensconced in traditions of international relations thought from their very inception is the first task of my lecture. I then want to argue that secularization, not in the sense of a general decline in popular religious belief, but in the sense of a decline in religion's influence on politics, deepened over the subsequent three centuries, first in Europe, then in politics around the globe. This trend reached its peak in the 20th century during what I want to call the March of the Jacobins, a phalanx of secularizing political movements that had great influence and impact across the world. But after the March of the Jacobins peaked 
in the course of the 20th century between 1917 and 1916, a sharp and sudden reversal occurred. Over the past four decades, religion's influence on politics has returned, abruptly challenging the secular character of both global politics and international relations theory. The next stage of my lecture charts and explains this reversal. But clouding and lurking behind discussions of this kind, I think, is an issue that has to be clarified from the start. Namely, what does it mean to be secular? The secularism of international relations theory inhibits its ability to understand and grasp the ongoing resurgence of religion in global politics. But again, what exactly does it mean to be secular? The international relations scholar Daniel Philpott and I propose that nine concepts of the secular, which uh, are, are on a slide or were on a slide uh, uh, behind me, it's um, there on that screen. <laughs> Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks very much. Daniel Philpott and I propose that nine concepts of the secular help map its possible range of meanings and in turn distinguish in what sense international relations has been secular in practice and in thought. The first four are positive or neutral towards religion. The next five are negative. The first and oldest concept of the secular dates back to the medieval Europe. It could be called ecclesiastical secularism where it pertained simply to affairs outside the realm of the monastic. It actually was a distinction within religion and within the church between different kinds of clerics, some of which were in the monastery, some of which operated in the world. In a second sense, secular can refer to an idea or expression formulated so as to make no specific reference to religion, but without being necessarily hostile or indifferent to religion. You could call this residual secularism. Secularism is anything that is not specifically uh, religious. More relevant to our purposes is a third sense of the secular, which refers to the differentiation of religion from other spheres of social life, politics, economics, culture, but in a manner that does not necessarily spell the decline of the public influence of religion. Religion-friendly differentiation, you could call it. In the realm of politics, differentiation involves a mutual autonomy between religious bodies and political institutions and their foundational constitutional authority. Crucial for this third concept of the secular is that differentiation need not entail the decline of religion's political efficacy. This possibility that religion could remain politically efficacious from a differentiated institutional standpoint has been proposed by a long line of philosophers of modernity, including 19th century theorists of civil society like Tocqueville, the great scholar of religion Ernst Trelch in the 20th century, and some contemporary sociologists of religion such as David Martin. And it's the central insight of sociologist Jose Casanova's outstanding work, Public Religions in the Modern World, which argues that religion continues to play an influential public role in modern Western liberal democracies, even though religious institutions are differentiated from the other institutions of society, including the state. A fourth concept of the secular means not the decline of religion, but rather a social context that is particular to the modern world, namely one in which faith is one of a wide array of socially available options rather than an established, unquestioned pillar in the architecture of the universe. <coughs> Philosopher Charles Taylor has recently revived this concept in his book, A Secular Age, though it has antecedents in the thought of sociologist Peter Berger and others. In short, this concept of the secular means that religion is one of a variety of options, that in modern conditions there is a plurality of options. We no longer have a sacred canopy cast over society to give comprehensive religious meaning. Rather, religion is one choice among many. You could call this plurality sec secularism. I, pardon me that uh, the scholastic complexity of uh, these uh, concepts means that this is in very small print. Uh, so I've discussed uh, four, the first four concepts of secularism listed uh, behind me. 
The subsequent five concepts of the secular, in one way or another, suggest a negative fate for religion. Each represents some aspect of what's known as secularization theory. The claim that as the juggernaut of modernity advances through science, economic progress, free inquiry, technological progress, political liberalization, democratization, and biblical criticism, religion will recede and eventually disappear. Sometimes the thesis is put in very sweeping terms. Religion in all of its manifestations is on the way out. God is dead. But it also has been advanced in more limited, precise ways, corresponding to the following four concepts of the secular, the first four negative concepts of the secular below. So what are these concepts? In the fifth concept, secularization occurs when large numbers of individuals cease to adhere to religious beliefs. You could call this belief secularization. The sixth sense of the secular is a decline of religious practice, particularly communal religious practice, a decline that can take place independently of a decline in belief. You could call this belonging secularization. The seventh concept of the secular, also one of secularization, is like concept three, concept three, separation secularism, in that it asserts differentiation, but here religion is becoming differentiated from other social spheres in a way not that reconfigures and preserves its influence, but in a way that spells its general decline. Differentiation is not mere separation, not mere institutional distinction, again as in concept three, but religion is, is differentiated in a way that leads to its isolation and, mar and marginalization. In an eighth concept of the secular, religion loses its political influence due to the intentional efforts of regimes to suppress it rather than through spontaneous decline. This type of secularization need not correspond to the decline of religious belief or practice at all, but is a product of the intentional efforts of political regimes to marginalize it. This could be called suppression or control secularization, and it has a, has a great deal to do with the massive expansion of political secularism in the 20th century, which I'll talk about later, the march of the Jacobins, particularly during the peak of the uh, march of political secularism between 1917 and 1967. Finally, the ninth concept of the secular is different from all the others insofar as it is not a description of a process or a state of affairs at all. It's rather doctrinal secularism, an ideology or set of normative beliefs that advocates the quarantining or containment of religion from other spheres of life. I spend time talking about these distinct concepts of secularism because I think we tend to think of secularism as a, an undifferentiated syndrome or package uh, that, uh, that totalistically applies to societies or does not apply at all to societies. So we think of some uh, societies like our own as secular, and we think of some societies like Iran as religious or theocratic, when in fact secularism has many, many distinct meanings. Uh, it it is, uh, 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 has many, many different uh, uh, distinct, uh, ontologically distinct uh, uh, aspects to it, and it's important to understand, too, that these concepts are in principle uh, uh, separable from each other. They don't necessarily have to occur in a package, it's possible for a society to have institutional differentiation between religion and other aspects of society without there being a decline in religious belief, without there being, being a decline in, uh, in religious practice, uh, and so forth. International relations theory, I argue, is secular in good part because it reflects the profoundly secularizing historical transformation that established modern international relations itself. It was not a transformation that involved a popular decline in religious belief or practice, the secularization encapsulated in concept uh, five. Rather, it involved a change in the authority structure of European politics, a trajectory entailing the secularization noted in concept seven, a continent-wide differentiation of religious and political authority that resulted in the decline of religious influence. And within sovereign states, secularization of the sort described by concept eight, a subordination of religion to state authority. The events that established modern international relations in Europe during the 17th century consolidated a centuries-long metamorphosis away from an authority structure that was quite undifferentiated, that of Europe during the High Middle Ages, roughly from the 11th to the 13th centuries. This was a trans-territorial res publica Christiana, or Christian Commonwealth. 
Authorities at all levels in medieval Europe commonly viewed themselves as part of a realm characterized by mutual moral ideals and a common spiritual membership. But over the, the next three and a half centuries, uh, from the, 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 the 17th century onward, trans -territorial, trans, uh, 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 this transterritorial, transnational realm would gradually, piece by piece, be replaced by sovereign states and their diametrically opposite combination of fragmentation and moral obligation and membership combined with segmentation and internal centralization and political authority. By the early 16th century, England, France, Spain, and Sweden already all looked very much like sovereign states, while a small sovereign state system had existed for over a century in Italy. But accelerating Europe's historical momentum dramatically towards sovereign statehood was the Protestant Reformation which began in 1517. Its very political theology, i.e. the doctrines through which basic theological claims are translated into political ends, prescribed the seizure of the church's remaining temporal powers and the end of the emperor's right to enforce the church's spiritual powers. Wars along confessional lines ensued and were settled in initially in the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. Based on the principle cus regio eius religio, the settlement allowed Catholic and Protestant princes each to enforce their own orthodoxy throughout their entire territory, effectively consolidating their sovereignty. But Augsburg proved unstable and contested, leaving behind claims and counterclaims that eventually exploded into the Thirty Years' War of 1618-1648. A small literature now exists debating whether the Peace of Westphalia, the settlement that ended the Thirty Years' War, deserves to be regarded as a pivot point in the history of international relations and as the origin of modern international relations. Whatever precise historical realities changed through and after the settlement itself, Westphalia unquestionably symbolized the consolidation of the long historical transformation from the authority structure of medieval Europe to that of the modern state system in the middle of the 17th century. This Westphalian synthesis, as this new authority structure could be called, consists of five strands, which I'll just quickly enumerate, each of which describes a different aspect of political authority and, we contend, a different dimension of secularization. The first strand was the victory of the sovereign state and the corresponding curtailment of the transnational authority of the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope. The second strand of the Westphalian synthesis was a vast decline in state intervention to alter the governance of religion within the territory of other states. It was not a total silencing, to be sure, but in his major study of the history of war, political scientist Kalevi Holsti argues that religion caused only three wars between 1648 and 1713, the 50 or so years after the Peace of Westphalia, with all of these being between Europeans and Muslims who were outside of the sovereign state system. The third strand of the Westphalian synthesis involves secularization within states rather than transnationally, and in fact a somewhat different kind of secularization, that of concept eight, involving the subordination of the church to the state. What obtained here was not the far stronger political subordination that we'll be talking about in a minute, which was characteristic of the French Revolution and 19th century republicanism, or still less the even harsher repression characteristic of 20th century dictatorships, but rather what came to be known as Erastianism, the strong governance of church affairs by the state, a stronger govern governance than had, than, than had been seen in Europe since before the High Middle Ages. Writes Reformation historian Ewan Cameron, after the Reformation and, and, and after the establishment of Erastianism throughout Europe, quote, the Lutheran churches became very largely departments of state in their respective territories. The French Catholic Church, too, was increasingly subject to the power of the king. The fourth strand complements the third. It involved the sharply reduced temporal powers of religious authorities, especially Catholic bishops. Finally, the rise of nationalism as a locus of popular identity and loyalty amounts to a fifth strand of the Westphalian synthesis. Early modern religion served often to direct people to place, quote, faith in nation, to borrow the title of Anthony Marx's book on the subject. Since nations seek self-government often through an independent state, such faith also directed loyalties away from the transnational authority of the Catholic Church and thus reinforced differentiation. 
Elizabeth Shackman Hurd, scholar at Northwestern University of International Relations, has argued that secularism is, quote, one of the most important organizing principles of modern politics. The formation of the modern sovereign state system was indeed a profoundly secularizing set of events. From the late 18th century to the late 20th century, political secularism continued its dramatic global expansion, both intellectually and politically, in theory and in practice. And here, we're talking primarily about concept eight, the subordination of religion to the state. The form of secularism and secularization that continued to build with great momentum during this period was the doctrine reflected in thought and practice that the state should actively subordinate religious authority to political authority, religious institutions to political institutions, and religious claims to political claims, all in the interests of promoting the well-being of society as a whole. Though much of this secularization occurred within states, it was very much a transnational phenomenon propelled by the diffusion of ideas and international networks. As radically as the early modern political secularism of Hugo Grotius, Jean Baudin, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and others broke from the medieval synthesis, from medieval integrationism, from the medieval framework of the res publica Christiana, and as much as it sought to reduce the influence of churches as political players, this early modern political secularism seldom mounted a direct or open assault on religion per se, and indeed almost always expressed itself in prima facie biblical and orthodox terms. The decisive break with this pattern came intellectually with Rousseau's social contract in 1762 and politically with the French Revolution launched in 1789 the march of the Jacobins was beginning. For the first time, Rousseau and his Jacobin acolytes openly identified the church and Christianity as implacably hostile to any free and flourishing republic. A church that remained beyond the control of the republican state and free to propagate its teachings without hindrance was not merely a latent source of political instability, but an active opponent of its core pr principles and purposes. This sense of a Manichaean conflict between church and republic meant that a policy of church-state separation was not sufficient. Instead, the republican state established by the French revolutionaries had to adopt nothing less than a policy of radical subordination and indeed transformation vis-a-vis -vis the church. This campaign of de-Christianization eliminated the church's right to perform marriages, its control over education, and its ownership of vast hectares of property. Even more seriously, the new regime brought the church much more strongly under the supervisory control of the state. While even under the old regime, the Gallican understanding between church and pope involved a strong state role in the appointment of bishops and priests, the new regime took this further by requiring oaths of, of loyalty to the revolutionary republic and in effect a program of ideological re-education. The Jacobin experiment, of course, ultimately faltered in France destroying itself in the conflagration of the terror. But the revolutionary flag was raised high enough and long enough that radicals throughout Europe and its settler societies in the Americas rallied around it. And the radical secularist template of the French Revolution inspired them to mobilize politically against the church as enemy number one. The revolution bequeathed a loose, though real transnational family of republican and anti-clerical movements. Sometimes these movements emerged with the help of French bayonets. In other cases, they were spawned by the sheer demonstration effect of the French Revolution's success in overthrowing the Ancien Regime, as well as by the dissemination of its leading ideas. The United Irish Movement and its violent 1798 insurrection, for example, were directly inspired by French revolutionary example and ideas. One revolutionary development in church-state relations that proved both especially portable and especially explosive was in education. In fits and starts, and despite massive resistance, French Republicans and liberals repeatedly pushed for a compulsory, state-supervised educational system designed to mold French youth into Republican citoyens. During the Third Republic, its main features, the main features of this educational system, lay control, teacher training in every department, universal and obligatory schooling, and state inspection of all schools, including church schools, were implemented as a top priority of the radical wing of the Republican majority. Theodore Zeldin rightly observed that in France, quote, the major political battle of the 19th century was therefore between the priest and the schoolmaster. 
Similar battles in which churches strongly resisted state-directed common school programs were fought throughout the 19th century and into the 20th centuries across the Western world, in the Netherlands, Belgium, the United States, Germany, and other countries. The sense that there was a, a, a widening, uh, widespread, intractable conflict, indeed a transnational conflict, between the partisans of the church, especially but not only the Catholic church, and the partisans of liberal political progress of a whole host of Jacobins deepened considerably in the second half of the 19th century. A key turning point in this widening conflict was 1864. What had sometimes been an inchoate, uh, inconsistently expressed anti-clerical attitude or tendency crystallized into a coherent political program in numerous countries after the publication in that year of Pope Pius IX's Syllabus of Errors. The syllabus condemned the doctrine that the Pope, quote, can and ought to reconcile himself with progress, with liberalism, and with modern civilization, unquote. The belief that the Pope and the Church irrevocably condemned liberalism, immediately precipitated a host of organized political campaigns designed to subject the church to even greater state control and regulation. In Germany, Bismarck <coughs> directed the parliament to limit the power of the Catholic Church in the Kulturkampf of the 1870s. In Belgium, the Liberal Party in the late 1870s implemented a program to greatly restrict the Catholic Church's role in education. The 1871 Paris Commune included the desecration of churches. Even in America, America was not immune to this widening conflict. The Blaine Amendments were passed in several states, and they were designed to prevent states from financially aiding sectarian schools, which always meant Catholic schools. These uh, amendments won legislative approval in dozens of states, and a Blaine Amendment only narrowly failed to pass the US Congress. In states like Oregon, at the beginning of the 20th century, laws were passed banning all young people from attending parochial schools, a policy that was overturned only with the U.S. Supreme Court case Pierce versus Society of Sisters in the 1920s. Later in France, Combs, Briand, and other radical Republicans pushed through the 1905 law of separation of church and state. While the law was less sweeping in its consequences than its framers intended, it nonetheless made a subordinationist political secularism, again referring to the concept eight, uh, concept eight of, of, uh, uh, of secularization, suppression secularization behind me, making that kind of concept an official, enduring, and non-negotiable feature of France's political system and political culture, one with certain modifications that remains uh, essentially intact to this day. 1864 was significant in this widening battle between the church and the Jacobins for another reason. 1864 was the, the first year, rather the year of the first meeting of the Communist International. And there is little doubt that, as Owen Chadwick has written, there is little doubt that, quote, Marxism was the most powerful philosophy of secularization in the 19th century. In its beginnings, communism was not an atheist philosophy. In the 1840s, in fact, Friedrich Engels much to his puzzlement, actually, and frustration, met communist Christians almost everywhere he went, England, France, Germany. And Ferdinand LaSalle, who was a more influ influential communist theoretician than Marx until about 1870, expressly combined Christianity and communism. But after the death of LaSalle in 1864, and after the publication of Das Kapital in 1867, communism as a philosophy and as a transnational political movement, increasingly incorporated a radical form of political secularism. Increasingly, religion was an institution and an allegiance that had to be systematically subordinated to political movements that sought the liberation of the proletariat from capitalist oppression. Particularly at a moment when the Pope seemed to be losing his transnational moral authority by declaring war on liberalism and progress, communism spoke with a growing moral authority, a growing transnational moral, moral authority, one that increasingly operated as an adversary rather than an ally of religion. A host of other intellectual and political movements of the late 18th and 19th centuries that were otherwise mutually contradictory, they agreed in almost nothing, Hegelian historicism, Bismarckian realism, Kantian positivism, 
the liberalism of John Stuart Mill, American federalism, uh, the utilitarianism of Bentham, the progressive historicism of Herbert Spencer, the rationalism of Kant. These philosophies agreed in almost nothing, but they mostly agreed with communists and radical republicans on a set of propositions that taken together yielded powerful ideological support for a program of political secularism. That a great new age of reason, freedom, and progress was arriving or would soon arrive. That this new age would be the final, was all, almost always the third in these conceptions, and culminating era of human history, a kind of secular eschaton or millennium. That God or providence or some divine or quasi-divine superintending force, history sometimes, almost always understood in ways markedly different from orthodox Christian conceptions of God, was orchestrating the uh, unfolding of events in the world in some essentially irresistible fashion so as to usher in this new and final age. And finally, that an essential if not primary agent in the realization of this great new age was the modern state. This whole package of ideas justified a view of the state that is radically, radically secular in the sense of suppression secularism, uh, concept eight, because it grants the state a supreme and overriding authority over sacred institutions and authorities that in the past would have enjoyed comparable or even supreme powers and privileges. In other words, churches and other specifically religious, confessional, and sectarian institutions were increasingly under a kind of pressure and obligation to accept a subordinate role vis-a-vis -vis the state so that history could reach its intended destination. These ideas about historical progress and the secular state helped to generate robust concepts of nationalism and internationalism, which in turn further contributed to the advance of political secularism in the 19th and 20th centuries. Arguably the greatest and most influential nationalist of the 19th century who had an enormous impact on anti-colonial nationalists throughout the third world in the late 19th century and early 20th century was Giuseppe Mazzini leader of the Young Italy movement and briefly dictator of the Roman Republic in 1849, Mazzini repudiated traditional Catholicism in favor of a, of a religion of universal humanity. He rejected the fall and original sin, but believed that God was leading mankind ineluctably toward the, quote, angelification of the individual and the establishment of a very different kind of divine kingdom on earth. But God's kingdom, he believed, would and should consist in the destruction of the papacy and its replacement by a secular council of the nations, a kind of proto-United uh, Nations headquartered in Rome. This council would represent the authentic nations of the world, that is, those that possessed the irrefutable marks of nationality, including natural frontiers, distinct languages, and distinct cultures. Similar quasi-religious elevations of the nation and nationalism achieved currency in France around the same time, thanks to Jules Michelet and Ernest Renan which leads us to the 20th century, march and retreat of an array of secular Jacobins. The political secularism that was radicalized and diffused throughout much of the West in the, in the century after the French Revolution of 1789 was in many ways even more radicalized and even more widely diffused in the half century after the Russian Revolution of 1917. States that had been bent on containing the social and political influence of institutionalized religion, containing, uh, in the sense of concept seven, containment secularization, increasingly began to adopt an even more militant program, the program of, of suppression secularization, program of eliminating the social and political influence of religion altogether, in some cases by destroying, subjugating, or eviscerating religious, religious institutions and centers of religious authority. Meanwhile, states outside the West that had not yet been exposed to secularism in theory or practice became experiments in radical political secularization. In this period, again, secularism and secularization progressed and diffused in part through transnational networks of, of ideas and individuals. 1917 can be taken as the rough beginning of this era of ultra-radical political secularism, this era of an even uh, more uh, extreme march of the Jacobins. 1917 was a busy year for governments turning their face from God, writes political scientist Anthony Gill. Not only did the Constitutional Council in Mexico effectively outlaw the Catholic Church in that year, 
as well as other religious denominations, but also a group of even more radical state builders, i.e. the Bolsheviks, seized power in a country halfway around the world. Combined with the already firmly established radicalism of French laïcité and the subsequent radicalism of the Kamalist revolution of the early 1920s, these revolutions succeeded in planting radical secularist experiments in the heart of the Catholic, Orthodox, and Muslim worlds within the first three decades of the 20th century. Revolutionary political activism of the left and the right was indeed the most consequential force for radical political secularization in the 20th century. Often inspired by the French revolutions, leftist revolutions like the Chinese Revolution, particularly in the more radical later phase of the Chinese Revolution, the Cultural Revolution, uh, the Cuban Revolution, nationalist revolutions like the Turkish and Egyptian revolutions, all these revolutions helped to create systems that at least for a time greatly increased, greatly expanded the power of governments around the world to regulate, contain, and suppress religious organizations. Nazi totalitarianism, or revolutionary activism of the right, spread by military occupation to some 20 countries, coercively deprived religious bodies of their independence and social influence, and of course, sought to eradicate entirely the people of one religion in particular. Thanks to such revolutionary and totalitarian movements, that part of the Russian Orthodox Church that was not wiped out entirely became an organ of the Soviet state. The Catholic Church in Mexico was criminalized and deprived of its property and its right to engage in political activity. The Ottoman Caliphate and Sharia law were abolished in Turkey, much to the outrage of Muslims around the world, particularly in British India. The Lamaist theocracy in Tibet was systematically destroyed and the Dalai Lama ultimately forced into exile by Ch Chinese communists between 1957 and 1959. Perhaps the largest grassroots religious organization in the Muslim world, the Muslim Brotherhood, was decimated and driven underground by Egyptian authorities in the 1950s and 1960s. It's difficult to uh, uh, even re recall how extensive uh, and how militant these movements were. But these revolutionary forms of political secularism and their aggressive assaults on religion uh, were really part of a pattern. They were not outliers. At the approximate midpoint in the 20th century, 1945, M. Cyril Bates did an exhaustive analysis of religion-state relations around the world. And he concluded, quote, recent intensifications of nationalism have fused with the increasing power and functions of the state to imperil and even to crush in some lands a liberty of religion that had been formerly achieved. The result he found was that, quote, religious liberty is today denied, deformed, or restricted for all or for part of the people in most of the countries of the world. In fact, by a rough calculation uh, that I've done with Dan Philpott, more than 50% of the world's population in the mid 20th century lived under secularist political regimes understood as regimes that systematically restricted the right and capacity of religious organizations to influence society and politics in the sense of concepts uh, uh, eight and nine at some point between 1917 and 1967, more than 50% of the world's population. As Bates notes, the surging nationalism associated with decolonization was in fact a major force for global secularism. The nationalisms of Ataturk in Turkey, of Diaz Senanayake in Sri Lanka, Jawaharlal Nehru in India, Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, uh, uh, Nkrumah in Ghana, Sukarno in Indonesia, Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya, all generally appealed to notions of national or civilizational greatness in which religion was but one subordinate element. Often their concepts of nationalism and national identity deliberately bracketed or subordinated substantive religious contributions, often in the hope of unifying diverse ethnic and religious groups in the context of anti-colonial struggles and post-colonial nation building. Sometimes nationalists in this period used religious appeals precisely to marginalize the social or political influence of traditional religion. A classic instance of this is uh, uh, in the case of Habib Bourguiba of Tunisia, who once during Ramadan uh, publicly raised a glass of lemonade to his lips before a large gathering of his citizens and proclaimed, quote, you are permitted to drink during Ramadan for the holy war, that is the effort to unite Islam, is first and foremost the battle of production 
conserve your strength so that you may work hard. Because these leaders had slain all manner of colonial dragons, and in some cases a domestic dragon or two, they enjoyed an unparalleled charismatic authority, one that enabled them to secure a modicum of legitimacy, for at least for a time, for their sometimes audacious experiments in secular nationalism. Uh, and many were as, auda as audacious as the experiments of Habib Bourguiba. Of course, to speak of these leaders as a group is not to imply that the secularist political agendas of all of these leaders were exactly the same. It's not to imply that the secularist political agendas of, say, a Nehru and an Ataturk or a Bourguiba and a Sukarno were identical in all respects. Nehru, for example, did secure a temporary ban of the Hindu nationalist Rashtriya Swayamsevak song, the RSS, in the exceptional circumstances following Mahatma Gandhi's assassination in 1948, and he also personally and repeatedly bemoaned the influence of religion on, on Indian society and hoped for a time when religion would have no influence in India. On the other hand, he never undertook a wholesale Kamalist-style effort to drive organized religion out of Indian public life. At the same time, though their tone and their tactics and their temperament differed, virtually every member of the first generation of post-colonial leaders articulated the hope that religious leaders and organizations would assume a smaller and smaller political role and exercise less and less political influence in their societies. They acted on this hope in different ways and with varying degrees of aggression, but it was a hope they all shared nonetheless. It's noteworthy, too, that this remarkable group of secular nationalists I've described actually constituted a kind of powerful transnational network. Among its members, there was profound mutual ideological borrowing and influence, as well as tangible mutual support and coordination. In his youth, for example, Nasser uh, was very influenced by Nkrumah. Uh, Nehru backed Nasser in the Suez Crisis and also backed Nkrumah in his bid to make the Gold Coast independent. They all learned socialism from Marx and state-centered industrialization and economic planning from the Soviets, as well as from each other. They all, all or most, most of them, drew inspiration from Mazzini, and they all stunned the world when they gathered dozens of world leaders to form what seemed at the, at the time a united, non-aligned movement uh, at uh, the Bandung Conference in 1955. All these trends towards political secularism were closely related to the dominant dynamics of international politics, it has to be emphasized. The calamity of World War I, for example, served to discredit alliances between throne and altar, between religion and the nation state. The post-millennialist relig religious utopianism that helped to fuel liberal internationalism, uh, in part, of course, uh, thanks, uh, uh, led by President Woodrow Wilson, collapsed in the face of the failure of the League of Nations and the rise of violent totalitarianisms in the 1920s and 1930s, causing even religious thinkers to repudiate faith-based approaches to international politics in favor of essentially secular doctrines like realism. Even a theologian like Reinhold Niebuhr, whom Martin White has aptly termed a Christian Machiavellian, articulated a skepticism that the deeds and policies of states could be understood as religiously motivated. In a world suffused with power, any pursuit of a religious or otherwise transcendent ideal would inevitably come to ironic ruin. Normatively, Niebuhr counseled states persons to choose the lesser of two evils. Furthermore, dominant global conflicts in this period tended to organize international politics into rival blocks that were defined in essentially secular, secular terms. Uh, the US and the Western Bloc versus the USSR and the Eastern Bloc, colonial powers versus anti-colonial movements, uh, etc., etc. The Bandung generation of third world statesmen was hardly alone, though, in thinking that an essential ingredient of modern progress was the secularization of politics. Sometimes called the rationalization of authority, sometimes characterized as the absence of Praetorianism, the capacity of states to build up their own sources of authority and to resist influence by religious and other actors was considered a hallmark of modern political development by an entire generation of post-war American social scientists and public intellectuals, including Gabriel Allman, Sidney Verba, Walt Whitman Rostow, David Apter, Daniel Lerner, Samuel Huntington, Arthur Schlesinger, Rupert Emerson, Walter Lippmann. Influenced by such ideas, American policymakers placed their bets in their foreign policy 
on, on aggressively modernizing and secularizing leaders like the Shah of Iran or No Dinh Diem of Vietnam. Around 1960, perhaps the only thing that the US State Department, the faculty of the Harvard Government Department, the Communist International, and the leaders of the Bandung Conference agreed on, it's hard to imagine them agreeing on anything, but the one thing they agreed on is that a society can be successful only insofar as its government and its citizenry keep religion from exercising a substantive influence on, on its politics. No secularity, no modernity. But by the late 1960s, things were beginning to change. Of course, in some ways, uh, it, it, the late 1960s seemed like a zenith uh, uh, for political secularism. Everyone, a term I don't use lightly, believed that the widespread aspiration for political secularism, for a politics and public life completely free of substantive religious influences, was rapidly becoming reality in, in virtually every part of the world. Writing about politics in Nasser's Egypt and Krumah's Ghana, Bourguiba's Tunisia, and Sihanouk's Cambodia, Jean-Luc Couture observed in 1970 that, quote, religion is doing such a good job of strengthening political authority that it is paving the way for its own deterioration. That was 1970. Richard Mitchell, a remarkably sensitive analyst of religious politics in the Middle East, predicted in 1968 that, quote, the essentially secular reform nationalism now in vogue in the Arab world will continue to operate to end the earlier appeal of the Muslim Brotherhood. He wrote in the same book that the Muslim Brotherhood would become a mere footnote in the history of the Middle East. Most sweepingly, eminent sociologist Peter Berger forecasted again in 1968 that, quote, by the 21st century, religious believers are likely to be found only in small sects huddled together to resist a worldwide secular culture. Secularization, it seemed, was not so much a speculative academic theory as an imminent, all-pervasive global reality. How on earth, then, did the march of the Jacobins, which reached to the far corners of the world, go into retreat? Well, despite political secularism's apparently unstoppable advances in the course of the 20th century, it began to experience remarkable setbacks in the 1960s, and these setbacks rapidly multiplied after 1967. First, many of the most important agents of political secularism declined or disappeared. Nehru died in 1964, opening space in the world's largest democracy for a much more religious politics. A series of coups thrust Sukarno from power in 1965, culminating in the liquidation, the brutal liquidation of Indonesia's Communist Party and the gradual rise of a more religion-based politics. And Krumah was overthrown in the coup in 1965-1966 ending the ideological hegemony of Nkrumahism, and paving the way for Ghana's churches to assert a more independent political influence. Nasser's armies were crushed by Israel in 1967, marking the beginning of the end of secular pan-Arabism, and clearing the way, interestingly, for Nasser's rival, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, to create a new transnational movement defined not by pan-Arab nationalism, but defined by religion, the organization of the Islamic Conference, which met for the first time in 1969. At least as importantly, Nasser's defeat in 1967 and his death just a couple of years later in 1970 cleared the way for a variety of actors to forge, with growing success over time, a transnational pan-Islamic consciousness. At the same time, communism, which had been a preeminent agent of global political secularization for 100 years, was increasingly on the moral and the strategic defensive, thanks to a whole host of factors, including the Sino-Soviet split, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, and so on. A movement that seemed to be in the vanguard of modern secular progress in the 1870s looked more like a declining and ideologically exhausted empire in the 1970s. A second factor is that many religious movements formerly sidelined or discredited by the global rise of political secularism began making a political comeback in the 1960s and 1970s. The Roman Catholic Church received a fresh burst of social and political self-confidence through the Second Vatican Council. Hindu nationalism, which had been the object of systematic attack and marginalization by the Secular Congress Party, it was, for example, forbidden to be simultaneously a Congress member and a member of communal groups like the RSS, played an increasingly assertive and, and, and influential role in politics. The political wing of the Hindu nationalist movement, the Bharatiya Jansang, won 10% of the national vote in the 1967 general elections 
and later helped to form a coalition government that defeated Indira Gandhi's Congress in 1977. The formation of an Islamic Republic of, of, of Iran in 1979 inspired, inspired Muslim movements around the world to believe that it was possible to Islamize politics and society. In general, one can discern a powerful qualitative shift in the orientation of religious organizations around the world towards politics. In every major religious tradition, leaders and movements abandoned an exclusive pietism or quiescence, a focus on spiritual or cultural activity, and took up political activity as an integral component of their religious mission. The Muslim Brotherhood, when it was first founded, was purely apolitical because of the influence of its founder, Hassan al-Banna. But soon, it began to shift in favor of political engagement. The RSS in the 1920s was founded as a purely cultural organization, but it soon began organizing political parties and other politically active organizations. The Roman Catholic Church promoted far more robust Catholic, or rather clerical, and lay activism in defense of human rights. Conservative Protestants in America abandoned their long fundamentalist self-isolation and distaste for politics, which had lasted from the 1925 Scopes trial to the late 1940s, in favor of organized and sustained social and political activism through such bodies as the National Association of Evangelicals and World Vision, and influential Buddhist leaders such as Walpola Ruhala in uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, called for an end to quiescence on the part of monks and lay Buddhists and instead for a robust engagement with politics. But it's something of a mystery when one thinks about it. Why did religious organizations all around the world in, in so many different religious traditions, in so many different regions of the world, demonstrate a growing desire and power to shape international politics after the late 1960s, all around the same time, in the late 1960s and 1970s. Certainly, retail explanations, the death or overthrow of charismatic secular leaders, the decline of communism, are part of the story. However, we need broader wholesale explanations in order to clarify why religious actors made a political comeback across the international system and beat back the march of the Jacobins. The first such explanation is that some of the dominant political and social trends of the 19th and 20th centuries failed to deliver the coup de grace to religion most analysts anticipated. Modernization was expected to weaken the hold of religion on society as people became more free, rational, and cosmopolitan. Programs of political secularization were intended to cut religion off from financial and symbolic support it received from the state whereupon the social power of religious institutions would decline. However, it turned out that such programs of institutional separation or differentiation between state and church, though often imposed on the church by aggressive secularists who were animated by doctrinal secularism, concept nine, did not necessarily end up weakening the church. Religious actors may have enjoyed fewer political privileges, fewer institutional ties to the state, but they soon realized that as a consequence, they enjoyed more freedom more freedom of maneuver. And the urbanization, economic development, and growth of literacy brought by modernization often created a petite bourgeoisie with the inclination and resources to give religious actors support and loyalty the state had ceased to provide. In other words, modernization and secularization, in the sense of concept three, institutional differentiation, often combine to increase the autonomy and capacity of religious organizations to formulate their own political agendas and mobilize their own resources and followers. The second wholesale explanation is that, is that global democratization greatly increased the opportunity of religious actors to freely compete for political influence. At least some charismatic third world leaders such as Nasser, Bourguiba, and Krumah and Ataturk were effective, secularize, effective secularizers because essentially they were latter day Rousseauian legislators. They sat at the apex of authoritarian or only partially democratic systems, and they could impose their secularist decrees in the name of general will theories of democracy without having to secure any genuine mandate from the people in competitive elections. But with the number of free and partly free countries, according to Freedom House, jumping from 93 in 1975 to almost 150 in 2005, religious groups the world, or, the world over enjoy a much greater opportunity to influence the political process by forming lobbies, fielding candidates, organizing political parties, and inviting politicians of all kinds to try to win their support. That's the second wholesale explanation, democratization. A third explanation is that globalization, globalization 
increase the capacity of religious actors to project influence, mobilize resources, and attract followers across national bound boundaries, greatly enhancing their overall political position vis-a-vis -vis nation states. I described at length at the beginning of my lecture the way in which the Westphalian synthesis worked above all to eliminate or weaken the transnational authority of transnational religious actors like the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. Today, globalization is in a sense helping to restore a pre-Westphalian situation, enhancing the transnational authority and reach and power of transnational religious actors. It was assumed that globalization would create a single global village, wiping away or at least blurring differences of religion, culture, and ethnicity. But however much globalization has caused people to appreciate their common humanity, it has also caused some people to appreciate their religious particularity, how different their religion is from the religion or lack of religion espoused by the people they see on TV or uh, see on the internet. Moreover, the closing of otherwise vast distances of space and time has enabled particular groups of co-religionists not only to feel like spiritual brothers and sisters, even across national boundaries, but to act, react, and organize as coherent political agencies. Millions of Christians around the world, for example, circulate bulletins via the internet and email detailing how fellow believers are persecuted in far-flung locales like Orissa in eastern India, Kaduna in Nigeria, and Sulawesi in Indonesia. And they act in remarkably coordinated fashion, forming transnational advocacy networks and coalitions that pressure governments and international organizations to stop the assaults on their faith. Via cable television and the internet, Millions of Muslims around the world rapidly learn about how Muhammad is depicted and dishonored in cartoons published in a small European country, Denmark, and soon Muslim governments, the OIC, tens of thousands of ordinary Muslims lodge vehement protests as well as organize efforts in international bodies to ban religious defamation. The expansion and intensification of global immigration, communication, and transportation because of the lower costs of immigration, communication, and transportation, has made it possible for more and more religious communities to establish effective transnational networks and organizations. In short, not only do religious actors think globally, they also act globally. And thanks to the accelerating processes of globalization, they can increasingly muster resources, mobilize constituencies, and apply pressure on governments and international organizations in ways that other non-state actors, and even some states, can only dream of. This very, very rushed, uh, broad brush portrait that I've given you of the rise and decline of political secularism inevitably omits and distorts a lot of important events and trends. The period that I describe as one long and dramatic ascent for political secularism, a march of the Jacobins from, from 1789 to 1967, did unquestionably see some exceptions to a trend towards political secularism. It unquestionably saw the rise, for example, of some uh, politically important religious movements, such as Christian democracy in Western Europe, which succeeded at least to, to some extent in resisting the general trend. Likewise, the period that I've described as the reversal of the March of the Jacobins, or the period in which the March of the Jacobins goes into retreat from 1967 to the present, has, has seen some forms of political secularism remain fairly resilient, such as French laïcité or the Chinese government's powerful combination of communism, capitalism, and Han nationalism. And our entire narrative would have to be cast somewhat differently if we were focused uh, particularly on the United States, though I do think that its own politics has seen a rise and decline of political secularism. Still, I'm confident that a basic qualitative shift in international politics has occurred. During most of the period between 1789 and 1967, a global march of the Jacobins put religious actors and ideologies on the defensive in almost every part of the world, affecting virtually every religious community in the world. During most of the period between 1967 and the present, the Jacobins are in retreat, with politically engaged religious actors of all kinds in every part of the world putting secular regimes and ideologies on the defensive. Thanks very much. We have a few minutes for questions. And, um, yes, sure. Of course. 
Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. Could you continue your analysis as it refers to uh, American foreign policy, particularly in the last uh, eight years? Um, it, with respect to American foreign policy being religious or secular or yes, what? what is the on American foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I think that um, the story that I'm telling uh, applies to foreign policy in that I think uh, one has seen since the 1970s a growing influence of religious actors on American foreign policy. American evangelicals, for example, are much more organized and are promoting uh, agendas with respect to a variety of issues uh, and are having some influence on shaping foreign policy. The Catholic Church, though, also. Uh, made very important statements about nuclear strategy in the 1980s. Uh, it would have been very difficult to imagine the Catholic Church of, say, the 1930s or 1940s issuing comparable statements and having a, a comparable influence and stimulating a comparable level of public discussion. So I do think that uh, our own public life has experienced the kind of trend that I'm talking about. Uh, polls, interestingly, in America show uh, in the 40s and 50s that Americans generally didn't like the idea of churches being actively involved in politics, but surveys now, uh, the 70s and 80s, show the reverse is true. Uh, so I think American attitudes have undergone the kind of shift that I'm describing, and there's a much greater openness to the idea that religious actors and groups should shape uh, public policy, including foreign policy. Professor Sigmund. <laughs> A member of the Harvard government department <laughs> in 1960. I was an instructor, but I was a member uh, before I came here. Uh, and as someone who uh, worked, uh, did a book with Reinhold Niebuhr, um, I was a bit uncomfortable with some of your characterizations. Um, but also as someone who spent a lot of time looking at uh, Christian democracy and related movements in. Uh, Europe and Latin America. Um, I guess I come to this with a, a slightly different, from a slightly different point of view. And I, my question would be: Shouldn't we distinguish between, and lots of people do this, between secular and secularist? Uh, mm -hmm. And isn't the secular state a logical conclusion from the religious belief in the primacy of conscience? Mm -hmm. Here is someone who's just done a book on John Locke, <laughs> whose yes, work, yes, uh, with yes. some exceptions, yeah. what he says about Catholics and atheists, uh, <laughs> is, you know, it seems to be a great kind of founding document of liberalism. Uh, it's not a founding document of secularism. Uh, I mean, it, it, it promotes, uh, it argues for, you know, pluralism, religious pluralism, and, and uh, religious voluntary The word voluntary is important uh, because uh, religion, uh, churches were compulsory societies yes. before that. Yes, and, exactly. And, uh, so that, uh, it seems to me if you believe in religion as a matter of conscience, following your conscience, it seems to me that is a core belief of Christianity, although not totally obvious throughout its history. Um, if you believe in that, you also believe that, that, that states should not use coercion to yes. force people mm -hmm. uh, in terms of religious belief or religious practice. Yes. Um, and so it seems to me you have to distinguish between uh, a, a development that I think is a very positive development, yes. which, which promotes religious pluralism and religious <laughs> freedom and recognizes the primacy of the individual. of that objective uh, contains a secular state that does not use its coercive power to support one religion or, and that's more debatable, all religions. Mm -hmm. um, that that's to, is to be distinguished from secularism, mm -hmm. which says religion is an obstacle. And why did they say religion was an obstacle? Because it was. Uh, religion was you know, claimed a monopoly of truth. Mm. And a religion that was sometimes, not always, uh, the religion of a, minor, uh, of a, a partial group, uh, but uh, never the religion of the whole group, but claimed that, that they had a unique access to truth which should be enforced coer coercively. Uh, so it seems to me that the 
resistance to religious political power was a resistance which was partly justifiable, not always the case in the case, justifiable in terms of the, of, of the religious belief. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't you distinguish between the kind of, you know, uh, working out of religious belief in the primacy of conscience and political working out, and the kind of militant secularism that sees religion as an enemy, and sometimes, which, uh, because sometimes it was an enemy, the end of the syllabus of errors. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, uh, it's a dangerous thing to be arguing with Paul Sigmund about the, these matters, from Reinhold Niebuhr to uh, natural law theory to liberalism and conscience and John Locke and almost everything I can think of. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm sure not successfully, but uh, I did try to, to make something like the distinction that you were making between the secular state uh, understood as a, as a state that's differentiated from religious institutions, that respects the autonomy of religion and conscience. That's, that's my third concept of secularism there from the forms of secularism and secularization below, which see religion as an obstacle to progress, see religion as dangerous, uh, and, um, and so forth. So I, I completely accept your distinction, and I clearly didn't uh, communicate it as clearly as I would have wanted to. Uh, I, I do think that um, uh, I would venture to say that, interestingly, even liberal theorists like John Locke and Hugo Grotius were surprisingly slow to accept the idea that the state should have uh, a, a, a relatively limited role in regulating and controlling religious groups. Even though thinkers like Locke and Grotius and others believed in individual liberty of conscience, as you know, they also tended to believe that the state should uh, regulate churches. Uh, Hugo Grotius had a highly Erastian view, for example, of how states should control uh, uh, religious institutions. Uh, and I do think that modern uh, political ideologies, even relatively progressive and liberal ones, uh, witness uh, republicanism and liberalism in Latin America or witness republicanism in Spain, have often had a highly intolerant attitude uh, towards religion that didn't respect conscience, uh, in fact. And this is the, your point about secularism, that many of these seemingly progressive forms of secularism, so-called liberal, so-called republican, actually had a very intolerant attitude uh, with respect to liberty of conscience, were willing to make war against religion in order to open up space in, in society. Uh, so I... I, I don't disagree with anything that you've you've you, you've Would said. Would you also agree that there were reasons why they saw it as opposed? Just to give you examples from the Latin American and Latin Europe uh, uh, cases, uh, Catholicism claims monopoly on education, monopoly right. on weddings, monopoly on cemeteries, uh, a, a whole area of uh, yeah. Claim, yeah. and and state support for priests. I think and, that, and that yeah. and it, uh, weren't liberals justified in objecting to this? Yes, uh, clearly. Though it it does seem that what the, the the pattern you tended to have in Latin American parts of Europe up even into the twentieth century was one of kind of um, uh, overreach on both sides. Uh, so the Catholic Church makes you know highly kind of totalistic, exaggerated claims for its uh, its authority. Uh, liberals then overreach by essentially stripping the church even of legitimate uh, rights and, and privileges. So there was this kind of uh, endless, uh, not, not endless, it did end, but uh, seemingly endless uh, battle that went back and forth that, that was encouraged by some of the secularist and secularizing ideas I was describing, uh, that uh, a new dawn is about to arrive of progress and reason and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but, but I agree with you that there were reasons, and, and in, in the world today, there remain reasons uh, in, uh, that religion is, a, is an obstacle to democratic progress. There's no question about that. Let's take one more question. Yes. Uh, to what extent is, is the rise of the authority of science connected to your story, the story of the rise of the domination of secularism? Uh, yes, uh, yes. I, I didn't get, pay enough attention to that, but th there's no question that uh, the rise of, uh, of, of rationalism and uh, ideas emanating from the Enlightenment, 
uh, and the increasing authority of, of science and scientists, scientific institutions uh, from the uh, 1700s or even from the 1600s through the uh, 19th, well into the 20th centuries contributed uh, to the story that I'm telling. Um, uh, and this is very much true not just on a macro level, but it's true on a micro level when you look at individuals like Nehru. Uh, Nehru studied, uh, uh, tri did tripods at Cambridge University, uh, which uh, was a kind of intensive uh, program that included uh, the natural sciences. And Nehru was extremely um, committed to the idea that, uh, that science uh, was uh, the wave of the future and that uh, nations like his could make progress only if science replaced superstition. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, it's a absolutely very much part of the story that, that I'm telling. And likewise, religion was associated with uh, a lack of a scientific spirit, uh, opposition to uh, progress in knowledge. Uh, and this runs through uh, many, many, many thinkers. Uh, uh, Hegel, for example, who is not generally uh, hostile to religion as such, a la the French revolutionaries, nevertheless makes a very invidious distinction in the philosophy of right between uh, the, the um, knowledge that we gain through science uh, and, uh, and, and the unquestioning kind of belief of religion uh, so that only if the, this unquestioning belief of religion is, is raised up uh, to scientific knowledge can society truly progress and become rational and liberal and so forth. So yes, there, 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 this, this, the whole story from the uh, um, 17th century right through the, the 20th century is definitely shaped by uh, uh, commitment to the idea that science is uh, uh, a supreme source of, of truth and enlightenment.